Chief Justice, may it please the court. I'm Giancarlo Conoparo. I'm Zach Smith. And welcome to SCOTUS 101, where we break down what's happening at the Supreme Court, what the justices are up to, and other things related to our favorite branch of government. Welcome back from the holidays to another episode of SCOTUS 101. Zach, how were your holidays? They were good. They were a little quieter than normal, but good. How were yours, GC? About the same. I, you know, as good as can be expected during the pandemic, I think. Well, excellent. Well, you know, the Supreme Court got back to work this week, issuing opinions, orders, and hearing oral arguments. Uh, so I say let's jump right into it. Uh, in fact, this week, the court released an opinion in one case, City of Chicago v. Illinois. This case was originally scheduled to be heard last term, but oral argument was delayed to this term because of the pandemic. This case is a textualist dream because it focused on how the text of two sections of the bankruptcy code interacted and what the text of each of those sections actually meant and provided for. By way of background, whenever someone files for bankruptcy, the bankruptcy code's powerful automatic stay provision takes effect, which prohibits creditors from taking a variety of actions against the debtor who filed for bankruptcy or the debtor's property, which becomes part of the bankruptcy estate. If a creditor willfully violates the stay, that creditor can face harsh penalties, including uh, paying for the debtor's actual damages, uh, paying for their cost and attorney's fees, and in appropriate circumstances, uh, even paying punitive damages. So stay violations are a big, big deal. The question before the court in this case was whether the mere retention of property after someone files a bankruptcy petition violates Section 362A3 of the Bankruptcy Code, which is the automatic stay provision prohibiting someone from taking any action to obtain possession of the bankruptcy estate's property or from taking any actions to exercise control over it after the bankruptcy petition has been filed. Here, the city of Chicago had impounded the debtor's cars for unpaid tickets. After the city impounded the cars, but before they could sell them, each of the debtors filed a bankruptcy petition and demanded the return of their cars. The city refused, and a bankruptcy court found the city's actions violated the automatic stay. The Seventh Circuit agreed. In an 8-0 opinion authored by Justice Samuel Alito, however, the Supreme Court disagreed. Justice Alito said that merely retaining property after the bankruptcy petition had been filed did not violate the bankruptcy code's automatic stay provision. He said that instead, it simply halts an affirmative act that would alter the status quo as of the time of the filing of a bankruptcy petition. Instead, he said Section 542 of the bankruptcy code is the appropriate provision that expressly governs the turnover of estate property. He noted that the court was not deciding how those turnover obligations should operate in practice, nor was the court deciding the meaning of any of the other prohibited acts under the bankruptcy code's automatic stay provisions. Justice Sonia Sotomayor wrote a separate concurrence emphasizing these last two points, saying that the court has not decided whether and when the bankruptcy code's other stay provisions may require a creditor to return property. And she also noted the practical hardships caused by the city's refusal to return the debtor's cars and the slowness of turnover procedures under the current bankruptcy code. She urged either the Advisory Committee on the Rules of Bankruptcy Procedure to consider amendments or for Congress to implement expedited procedures via statute. Justice Amy Coney Barrett took no part in this decision. You know, bankruptcy cases, as dry as they can be, serve a really interesting function to me. And it is they prove that when there aren't political forces pulling justices one way or the other, we really are all textualists. That's really true, GC. This really was uh, a textualist dream case because it focused on the plain language of the statute. Uh, so it was, it was an interesting argument to listen to. There were a few notable orders. First up, the court granted a request by the Food and Drug Administration to reinstate a regulation that requires abortion pills to be picked up in person from a healthcare provider and forbids them from being mailed. A lower court judge had struck down that regulation because of the pandemic, as is typical in shadow docket cases, there was no majority, but Justice Breyer would have denied the FDA's request, although he didn't provide any reasoning. 
The chief justice concurred in the decision, writing that the issue is not whether continuation of the regulation during the pandemic restricted access to abortion, but whether the district court was right not to defer to the FDA. Justice Sotomayor, joined by Justice Kagan, dissented, arguing that the regulation imposed an undue burden on the right of a woman to obtain an abortion during the pandemic. The court also denied several attempts to postpone the execution of Lisa Montgomery, who was sentenced to death in 2008 for strangling Bobby Jo Stinnett to death and cutting her unborn baby out of her womb in order to take the baby as her own. There were three separate petitions on different legal grounds to stop the execution. In one, the court was unanimous, and in two, the court's three liberal justices dissented. Montgomery was the first woman to be executed by the federal government since 1953. There are two more federal executions scheduled before President Trump leaves office next week, but there is currently ongoing litigation surrounding both of those cases. Well, we had oral arguments this week. The first up is Uzuebunam versus Prochevsky. I made it through that with the help of my wife, who is Nigerian and could help me with the, the petitioner's name. I'm duly impressed, GC. Thank you. It was a challenge. This is an interesting free speech case that will decide whether a claim for nominal damages for violating someone's free speech rights can survive when it's not attached to a claim for prospective injunctive relief or other compensatory damages. So here, the petitioner was a student at a public college in Georgia, Georgia Gwinnett, where he converted to Christianity. He tried to talk to students one-on-one -on -one about his faith in a public square on campus, but was told by the campus police that he had to use the free speech zone. When he went to the free speech zone, however, the campus police threatened to prosecute him for disorderly conduct because his speech violated the university's policy that prohibited speech that might cause another student in their own subjective judgment to feel uncomfortable. You really can't make this stuff up. So Uzuebunam sued and sought an injunction against the school's policy and nominal damages for the school's violation of his rights to free speech. The school first argued that the First Amendment somehow didn't apply to Azuebanam, but then decided it didn't want to be an Orwellian villain and change the policy. So that left Uzuebanam with only a claim for nominal damages. The lower court ruled that a claim for purely nominal damages was not enough to create a real case or controversy. What this case boils down to is whether nominal damages serve a real compensatory purpose or whether they amount to just a declaration that someone has won. If the latter, then the justices seem to agree that they would be just an advisory opinion, which the Constitution forbids. Kristen Wagner of the Alliance Defending Freedom argued on behalf of Petitioner that cases such as this one uh, do serve a compensatory purpose, even though the harm may be intangible or difficult to quantify. The Solicitor General of Georgia, Andrew Pinson, presented the argument on behalf of the state, arguing the opposite, that nominal damages are not compensatory. Justices Gorsuch and Kagan suggested that creative lawyers and economists can always put a price on anything, so surely a legitimately aggrieved plaintiff should be able to come up with some sort of compensatory damage amount. Gorsuch acknowledged, though, on the flip side, that some religious plaintiffs' beliefs may forbid them from seeking compensatory damages, and some plaintiffs can't afford creative lawyers and economists. Justice Kagan, also playing devil's advocate to herself earlier, cited the Taylor Swift sexual assault case where she wanted only a dollar in damages and pushed Georgia's Solicitor General to explain how that case was meaningfully different than this one. They were very tough questions for both sides, so I'm not going to offer predictions. That seems like a really interesting and important case, GC. Also, the courts had a lot of uh, pop culture references uh, this week. In the next case, AMG Capital v. FTC, Justice Barrett, in fact, referenced uh, Netflix's Dirty Money. Uh, so the justices are, are staying current, it seems like. But this AMG Capital v. FTC case is an interesting one because it's one of those rare cases where the Solicitor General's office did not argue the case for the government. Here, the FTC's Deputy General Counsel for Litigation, Joel Marcus, presented arguments. The FTC has the extremely rare privilege among federal agencies of representing itself before the Supreme Court when the Solicitor General either authorizes it to do so or refuses to represent it. In its simplest terms, this case involves whether the FTC, a consumer protection agency, can demand that a defendant that cheats the public must return the money they gained through that activity. 
The FTC has been making such demands for years, and lower courts have, until recently, been ruling in the FTC's favor. You would think this would be a simple case, but it's not. The issue in this case centers around whether the FTC can demand monetary relief such as restitution under Section 13B of the Federal Trade Commission Act, which authorizes it to seek both preliminary and permanent injunctions to prevent future violations of the law. Here, the petitioner, AMG Management, says the FTC cannot make a monetary demand because the plain text of the statute does not provide for it. To bolster its argument, it notes that monetary remedies are explicitly provided for in other parts of the FTC Act, but not in Section 13b. The justices seem genuinely perplexed as to how to resolve this case. Justice Breyer went so far as to compliment both parties on their excellent briefs and jokingly said he thought they're both right, even though he knows that can't be the case. But as of the oral argument, he said, that's where I am. This case seems to pit the plain text of the statute against how it's historically been understood and functioned. It'll be interesting to see how the justices rule in it. The court also heard oral argument in FAM versus Guzman Chavez, which deals with complex statutory interpretation questions about whether certain categories of immigrants can be released on bond pending a removal proceeding. The justices granted certiorari in 14 new cases last week, with notable ones being Americans for Prosperity Foundation v. Becerra and Thomas More Law Center v. Becerra, where the court is being asked to decide whether the California Attorney General's decision to compel these charities to release the names and addresses of their major donors violates their First Amendment rights. Also notable, the court took up a case called Mahoney Area School District, where the court is going to decide whether and to what extent school officials can punish students for off-campus speech. Not not a good time to be a free speech advocate at schools, I think. Uh, It's definitely uh, seems to be under scrutiny right now, to say the least. Well, as you know, as much as we love talking about the goings-on of the judicial process on this show, we love even more to talk to those people who make it happen. This week, we are joined by Judge Matthew Kaczmarek, federal district judge in the Northern District of Texas. After graduating law school at the University of Texas, Judge Kaczmarek worked as an associate at Baker Botts. He then served as an assistant United States attorney and, among other cases, helped secure the prosecution of Khalid Ali M. Al-Zwari. He has also served as a deputy general counsel to the First Liberty Institute. Here's my interview with the judge. Well, we're joined today by Judge Kazmarek. Judge, thank you for joining us. Glad to be here. So, Judge, let's start at the very beginning. When and how did you know that you wanted to be a lawyer? So I didn't always want to be a lawyer. So my father, grandfather, and great uncle were all pilots, uh, and I was raised in a household focused on aviation. So after serving in the Air Force, my father spent his post-military career working at Lockheed Martin in Fort Worth and working on the Israeli Air Force F-16 fighter program. So I spent um, my childhood idolizing IAF fighter pilots, watching Top Gun, and wanted to be a fighter pilot. Uh, But the decision uh, to attend law school probably happened at at the midpoint of my undergraduate experience. So, uh, but but may have even started as early. The thought of it probably started in middle and high school. So. I'm old enough uh, to remember uh, the Robert Bork hearings, Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, at the time, during middle and high school, I read um, several books by Robert Bork, The Antitrust Paradox, The Tempting of America, Slouching Towards Gomorrah, that started to pique my interest in the law. And then during um, undergrad, I read Justice Scalia's book on judicial philosophy, A Matter of Interpretation. And uh, this was really before Westlaw and Lexus. I had to uh, bury into the library and find Justice Scalia's dissents, uh, his most famous dissents. Started reading that. And then um, really reading Thomas Sowell. So um, as an undergrad, I devoured every book written by Thomas Sowell. And several of those are focused on concepts of justice and uh, the rule of elites and the commanding heights. And that really kind of made the decision to 
at least attend law school, but not necessarily to practice law. I'm curious, what is it that first sparked that very first interest to even read a book by Bork or Scalia? I think it was the confirmation hearings uh, that I I had observed on TV. Uh, Both my parents were um, fairly active in, in politics in Texas. So watching the role of the judiciary and and how that intersected with confirmation battles, um, some of the changing political landscape in Texas where I grew up, and I just saw the outsized role that federal judges played uh, in deciding those important questions. Um, and that really ignited an interest first in Robert Bork, uh, then in Justice Scalia, and then uh, Thomas Sowell from from sort of the philosophy side and, and economics. So I uh, uh, didn't necessarily have it in curriculum, but I, I devoured everything I could by those authors. And um, I, was, I was convinced that a law degree uh, was a way to participate in that process. And so you go to law school, and then afterwards uh, you end up at Baker Botts. What sort of work did you do there? Well, actually, that there is an intervening event. So I was in law school when 9-11 happened. Um, I was in uh, Austin. Um, and in those intervening months and years, I actually recruited into the Central Intelligence Agency and received an offer to serve as a collection management officer. So candidly, I thought I would uh, serve as an intelligence officer in the war on terror. That's what I thought I would do with my law degree. Um, but for family and, and personal reasons, I ultimately deferred and declined and then uh, move, moved into private practice. So uh, it was um, a general commercial litigation, intellectual property, and appellate practice with um, the, the best possible mentors in the entire state of Texas. So if you know the history of Baker Botts, it's one of the oldest uh, law firms in the state, uh, the Baker family is, is well known uh, to people in Texas and, and even D.C. And when when you work there, you have access to the best possible um, trial and appellate attorneys in the entire state of Texas and, and attorneys who had served for served alongside Governor and then President George W. Bush. Uh, I was uh, really fortunate uh, to be next door neighbors to an attorney who had served as an ambassador to Saudi Arabia. Uh, and in, in the appellate sections, you have partners and associates who were Supreme Court clerks to Justices Rehnquist, Scalia, and Thomas. So I didn't know it when I accepted the offer, but um, I, I hit the lottery of, of mentorship when, when I joined the firm because it's just riddled with talent and, and just the best and brightest trial and appellate attorneys you could hope for. Who have been or are some of your mentors? I have um, been blessed with an embarrassment of riches in, in the mentorship category. So in law school, in the midst of September 11th and, and the war on terror, I was mentored by uh, Admiral Bobby Inman, uh, who's a former DCI at the time was teaching at the LBJ school at the University of Texas. Uh, I had a national security law mentor in uh, Ron Sievert who had uh, worked on several high profile cases and and had worked uh, even on some uh, international cases. Uh, when I went to Baker Botts, I had some of those partners uh, that you mentioned um, who uh, practice at the highest possible level. Uh, at the U.S. Attorney's Office, I uh, had uh, the privilege to work on Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act cases with real professionals uh, who had uh, built a career in the National Security Division uh, and then uh, were there for some of those immediate high-profile cases in the Northern District of Texas, like Holy Land Foundation and, and the Old Wasari case. And um, at at every level, I've, I've, I've been blessed to have mentors I did not deserve. Uh, in fact, in law school, I took a summer course with Justice Scalia and uh, learned separation of powers from Justice Scalia, which is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So I can't claim that any of it was planned, but I'm certainly fortunate for having such tremendous mentors.
tell me a little bit. So you you went from Baker Botts to the U.S. Attorney's Office, from civil litigation to criminal. And part of what you did, or, or while you were at the U.S. Attorney's Office, you secured a, you you played a role in securing the conviction of Khalid Ali Aldaswari. Yeah. So um, I joined uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, starting in the Dallas Division in around the year 2008 and at that time uh, there, there were still uh, some war on terror uh, fact patterns percolating uh, through the Joint Terrorism Task Force. Uh, some, some high profile cases were coming through the office at the time. Uh, Holy Land Foundation, uh, which there are two versions of that case, uh, the Samadhi case, uh, better known as the, uh, the Fountain Place bombing uh, case, and then uh, Aldo Sari. Uh, which involved a, um, a FISA warrant and, and prosecution of a Saudi-born national who was building a picric acid bomb uh, to blow up uh, various targets on his target list. And because I, I did have security clearances through the CIA process and then, and then was able to re-up those, I, I segued on to those teams as an appellate division, AUSA, uh, looking at the legal aspects of the case, making sure uh, you know the the prosecution and eventual appeal complied uh, with all the statutory and jurisprudential requirements. And in, in a way, it was a way to redeem uh, some of the interest and in, in study I'd done into terrorism, national security law, and all of that. So I was able to to, to use some of that background and, and some of that experience on those cases and argued uh, the Fifth Circuit appeal, uh, which really focused heavily on what at the time I think was the nation's first uh, attempted use of WMD jury instruction. So a lot of cases to date had involved um, people who were building bombs and had gone as far as to attempt a detonation. In our case, the defendant had um, stopped prior of, of, of detonation or attempted detonation, and so we had all sorts of appellate issues relevant to uh, the su substantial step required to qualify for the INCOHE defense of, of using or attempting to use a WMD. So it was, it was really kind of a test case. Um, you can you can actually watch um, a Netflix uh, documentary about the agent side of the case. So Netflix has done a documentary called Terrorism Close Calls. It's about the Aldosari case and the FBI agents uh, who built that case. So, interesting. Um, yeah, very interesting. So this whole time you're uh, working as a criminal appellate work at the U.S. Attorney's Office, you're also still maintaining an interest in the First Amendment. And in fact, you were teaching at the time. What was that like? So I was privileged to be a substitute teacher, in essence. A friend uh, at the U.S. Attorney's Office, a DOJ employee, was unable to continue teaching a First Amendment course in uh, the Meadow School at, at SMU. So it's, a, it's actually an undergrad course, uh, mostly populated with students who are aspirant law students. It was probably my first realization of age. I, I realized that I was older uh, or significantly older than the students. Probably my first interaction with millennials and it was fascinating to see uh, the state of civics instruction and how um, many many K-12 programs have failed to teach the Constitution to their students. Um, I, I would say that the bad news is that a, a lot of students who uh, matriculate through our universities don't have a foundation in the Constitution. They don't have a particular coursework outside of maybe an AP government class. Uh, and so they're not familiar with the text. They're not familiar with some of the jurisprudence. That's the bad news. The good news is um, they're thirsty uh, for that knowledge. And uh, we started, you know, from, from the founding generation and went all the way through uh, some of the early 21st century cases. And it was my first opportunity uh, to see uh, what the millennial generation knew of, of constitutional law, what they knew of the First Amendment, 
And it, it was one of the, the best um, sort of uh, teaching experiences I've ever had. Was there a, a link between your teaching that class and then your decision to join First Liberty Institute? There was. Um, so I uh, attended a religious college uh, in undergraduate. I've always been interested in the First Amendment and uh, the, the free exercise and establishment clause questions arising therefrom. And uh, during the, the teaching of, of that course, um, I was recruited uh, to go work in the nonprofit sector on a permanent basis and to transfer some of those uh, First Amendment skills uh, into nonprofit practice. And uh, a lot of the ad attorneys uh, I had worked with had connections to SMU, SMU Law School or, or the Dallas area. So uh, that, that was kind of a pivot point into the nonprofit sector. And what did you do at First Liberty? So I had come from the appellate division and had that DOJ training and focused on an appellate practice initially, working on various amicus briefs and and working with uh, coalition partners uh, to generate and, and publish those amicus briefs. Had the opportunity to work with Catholic bishops. I worked uh, with scholars at the Heritage Foundation. Um, you know, on a case-by-case -case basis, we were able to assemble an impressive array of amicus briefs on all of the cases uh, presently pending at the Supreme Court. So it's something I had not done um, prior uh, uh, to going into the nonprofit sector. You know, as an appellate Division AUSA, you're always representing the United States of America, and there's a certain posture that every federal prosecutor enjoys uh, uh, going in, in, into oral argument or going off to the Fifth Circuit. But as, um, as a Miki, it, it's a different dynamic. Um, one thing I did not appreciate about the process um, until working in the nonprofit sector is the necessity of clientele and what it takes to recruit interested parties uh, who qualify uh, for uh, participation in, in the, um, the amicus briefing process. I mean, we spent uh, days, weeks, and months trying to find uh, the best possible amici clients uh, to represent uh, a particular issue or a particular vantage point. And so there was a lot of client and, and coalition work that I'd never done before. So it, it was yet another crash course in, in legal work. At what point did you decide you wanted to be a judge? Again, uh, this is um, this is uh, another volume in, in in my accidental career trajectory. So, um, a little a little while after the 2016 uh, election, I had uh, spoken with friends working with Senators Cruz and Cornyn about various appointment opportunities, and I initially was interested in the United States attorney opportunities that were emerging in Texas. So I think when I initiated the process, I was an applicant for U.S. attorney positions. I thought I would go back uh, to doing that work, shelter under the Department of Justice, and go back to being a prosecutor and, and doing law enforcement. But as the process unfolded in Texas and various Article three vacancies emerged. Um, I had uh, staffers and friends and, and, and members of the Federal Judicial Evaluation Committee who uh, encouraged me to also uh, apply for the Article three position. Um, my entire life, I had uh, focused on other branches of the government, uh, at least for employment. And it wasn't until that application process that people recommended the judiciary. Going back, Judge Bork got you in to the law. Did did uh, when you started going through the judicial process? Did you think, uh oh, maybe I'm, you know, <laughs> am I going to have the same kind of troubles that he did? did, did were you concerned about that at all? Oh, uh, I was. And uh, if you remember, uh, beginning in 2016, there had been various confirmation battles uh, involving nominees who had uh, litigated. Uh, controversial cases. They had controversial writings. And at the time, I was working in the nonprofit sector, publishing articles in the National Catholic Register, public discourse. I had uh, amicus briefs on, you know, the most intense First Amendment cases and, and cases of conscience. 
and that was a concern. Um, it was a concern primarily for my family. I, I had watched some of these vicious confirmation battles, and I had to make a decision uh, to endure that um, if if the campaign proved successful, and it did end up being uh, a crucible event. Uh, there's, I think, I think Winston Churchill said it's. Uh, there's nothing more exhilarating than to be shot out without effect. Um, there is also a certain exhilaration to seeing your name uh, in headlines and opposition papers and to have an Alliance for Justice report written about you. And it's a crucible for anybody who endures it. So, you know, whether you're Justice Kavanaugh or Kyle Duncan or, or any of these judges who had testy confirmation battles, um, it is a strain and a stress on family. But you made it through and you've been on the bench now for about a year and a half. Am I, is, that, is that right? Yes, that's right. So almost exactly a year and a half. And what are some of your reflections on your first year and a half? I wish I had clerked. So I didn't have a chamber's perspective on the Article Three branch. I'd always been a practitioner and an advocate. I'd been at the podium, but I'd never been behind the wall uh, to see the internal operations of chambers. And because of my pursuit of CIA employment, I, I didn't even consider a law clerkship uh, when I was in law school. I wish I had done that to understand all of the administrative uh, elements of this job, uh, the importance of recruiting law clerks. I wish I'd have had a crash course uh, in in all of that as a law clerk. Um, but I'm grateful to work in uh, the Northern District of Texas, which is one of the larger districts in the country. It has uh, superb facilities, superb staff, and you know that first year uh, working in a single judge division. Uh, we were just trying to turn on the lights, blow off the dust. Uh, my predecessor had um, been in semi-retirement for many years, visiting judges, recovering the docket. So we we had to turn on the lights. We had to dust off the tables. We had to find furniture. Uh, we had to get templates and forms up and running. And I don't have a natural entrepreneurial nature or spirit. So um, you just have to to work and, and learn and and build the thing as you're driving it. I, I joke that uh, it feels like you're building the car as you're driving it. Um, having hearings at the same time, you're finalizing templates, um, hiring law clerks and onboarding them and doing a hearing the very next day. So it it was a it was a challenge and and um, if I had to do it all over again, I would have done a clerkship and I would encourage any of your listeners who are in law school uh, to pursue a judicial clerkship because I think it gives you a window into that world. Have you been able to now form some traditions uh, with your own law clerks? Yes. So I provide a reading list of books, articles, and briefs. Uh, as an example, I was fortunate to have writing instruction from Brian Garner, who's famous for his collaboration with Justice Scalia. And uh, I insist that my clerks uh, do a quick review or study of his books on, on winning briefing and winning writing. And um, we have a, a tradition now of uh, going to the gun course with, and, and this is so thoroughly Texan, uh, we take the law clerks uh, to the shooting range with um, the U.S. Marshals, and uh, we make sure that they're trained in gun safety and and learn how to shoot correctly. And uh, we've now done that. I've, I've been through two clerk classes, and that's an emerging uh, tradition. Uh, here in Amarillo, we have a local uh, minor league affiliate uh, with a beautiful new stadium. Uh, they're called the Amarillo Sod Poodles which I didn't even know what a sod poodle was prior to moving here. I don't. But, what is um, it? It's a prairie dog. Ah. Uh, it's a prairie dog. So oil fill, you know, this this is the land of cattle, oil, and gas, and uh, prairie dogs are everywhere. And uh, for whatever reason, um, the sod poodle nickname stuck and, and was popularized. And if, if you have small children, as I do, uh, there's nothing better than minor league baseball. Um you know, about every other inning, you know, they have some event on the field, they have fireworks, they, they really 
emphasize the fan experience. So I've uh, got my clerks involved in that. Uh, we, we go to a game, you know, when it's not uh, in coronavirus lockdown. And, um, yeah, we always – and I insist that my law clerks take – a trip to the world's second largest canyon, which is nearby, uh, about 10 minutes south of Amarillo. It's the Palo Duro Canyon, and it, it's rivaled only by the Grand Canyon. And so I insist that my clerks spend a day hiking the canyon and taking a clerk photograph for Chambers. <laughs> well, Judge, one final question before we let you go. Uh, if you could have a conversation with any Supreme Court justice, living or dead, who would it be and what would you talk about? So Justice Scalia was my instructor on separation of powers, and I was blessed to learn from him for a, semest a summer semester. And if I could speak to him again, I would ask him if he had changed his views on administrative deference. So that was a trajectory that he charted in his career. He had certain views on administrative law generally and deference doctrine specifically. Now that we've seen administrative law emerge, um, now that we have uh, one or two members of the court who are particularly focused on it, I would ask Justice Scalia if he changed his views on deference. Well, Judge, thanks so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Well, this, this has been a tremendous opportunity, and thank you for giving me the time, and thank you for all you do. Absolutely. Well, Zach, it's time for your favorite part of SCOTUS 101 and mine, <laughs> trivia. Well, I'm never going to be a Jeopardy champion, GC, so uh, hit me with what you've got. Okay. This week, I wanted to focus on the origins of Supreme Court justices. So, Zach, are you ready? As ready as I'm going to be. Number one, which state has produced the most Supreme Court justices? Ooh, that's tough. Uh, I'll guess New York. That is correct. That is correct. It's New York, and it's not even close. 17 justices were appointed from New York. Interesting. Okay. Number two, there is a three-way tie for second place. These three states have, have each produced nine justices. Can you name two of them? Well, my strategy here is to pick uh, members of the 13 colonies. Uh, so Wise. I will say... Virginia as one, and Massachusetts? You are correct. The third, however, might surprise you. It's actually Ohio. Interesting. I would not have guessed that, GC. Number three. Six Supreme Court justices were born in foreign countries, and I'm excluding <laughs> from that. <laughs> I'm excluding from foreign countries uh, uh, the British colonies. So can you name at least three Supreme Court justices born in a foreign country? Man, you're not easing us back into the trivia, are you? Nope. Uh, well, I know Felix Frankfurter uh, was born in Austria. So Felix Frankfurter, I think George Sutherland, uh, who is a justice or, or around the same time, was born in England uh, before he moved to the United States. And I really, you'll have to fill in the, the rest, GC. Those are, those are the two I, I know. Well, you got two right. That's great. So starting uh, chronologically, James Wilson, our very first justice, was born in Scotland and moved to the States at 23. James Iredell was born in England, came to the States at 17. William Paterson, born in Ireland, came to the States at two. And this one is probably the most interesting David Josiah Brewer was born in the Ottoman Empire. He was born uh, to American missionaries who returned to the States the year after his birth. Interesting. Okay, I learned something new. <laughs> All right, number four. Who was the first justice who was born in the United States rather than in British America? Ooh, I'll guess Roger Taney. Uh, because I know he was born in Maryland. He was in his late 80s when he died in the 1860s. Uh, so I think that would maybe put him in the, the ballpark of being around the right age. So uh, Roger Taney, that's my guess. It is a good guess, but the answer is actually the one and only Justice Joseph Story, born in Massachusetts. I guess it helps when you're appointed to the Supreme Court at uh, 32. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, final question. 
If you asked most people which law school produced the majority of justices, they would say Harvard. They would be wrong. What school has produced a majority of justices? Well, I'm guessing it's not my alma mater, the University of Florida, go Gators. Um, I, I don't know, but I will just uh, guess Yale <laughs> as the, the other choice. So it was actually a trick question. And, and, and so I'm not going to count this one against you. The key of the question was a majority. Although Harvard has produced a plurality of justices and Yale is the second place, a majority of Supreme Court justices actually did not attend law school at all. Oh, a trick question, GC. I think that's dirty pool, uh, especially the first week back after after the break. Uh, well, you did a respectable job nonetheless. Well, I appreciate it. And, and like I said, I learned some new information today, so that's always good. And with that, that's it for today. Thank you to everyone for listening to SCOTUS 101. Please be sure to subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever else you listen. And as always, please leave us a five-star rating. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at SCOTUS101 and email us at SCOTUS101 at heritage.org with your questions, comments, or ideas for future shows. Case is submitted. You've been listening to SCOTUS 101, brought to you by more than half a million members of the Heritage Foundation. Executive produced by Giancarlo Canaparo and Zach Smith. Sound designed by Lauren Evans, Mark Guiney, and John Pop. For more information, visit heritage.org.